Kristen Atchison here. We're talking about chapter 11, Perceiving Speech and Music. This is our fourth lecture um, where we're going to be talking about music. So music is really unique to humans. Um, no really other creatures have we really found have the ability to really compose music other than humans. And it really has a huge emotional um, response. Um, if you search, you know, music and brain on YouTube, pretty much all the videos you're going to get are about the emotional responses in the brain. Um, we'll see that dopamine is released um, in the same way that dopamine is released when we eat or when we have sex um, or when we take drugs, um, that we see these same kind of dopamine releases when we're listening to music. And this is really related to that emotional responses we have. And an understanding of music really requires um, us to understand the components of that sound, including pitch and loudness and timing and timber um, and all of those combinations. Um, and composers really play on these things. Um, so when I was talking about sound in the beginning in chapter um, nine, and I said, hey, if you know about music, if you write music, you know way more about this than I do because you have this experience um, and you need to know more about it so that you can manipulate those musical experiences based on these components of sound. So pitch, we've talked about some, um, but again, in music, it's really our most fundamental dimension. Um, so, and it really can, clearly can distinguish one composition from another. Um, it's really one of the main ways that we organize um, this, and we do this in terms of octaves. Um, and this is going to, they're gonna be separated proportionally. So we'll show you an image here in a second that really shows that these are, are very proportionately divided. Um, these are um, notes that are separated by an octave um, are perceived very, very similarly. Um, so if you've watched that auditory illusion video, you that one where they're like, is the sound going, the tone, the pitch going up or down? Um, it's an issue of these are the same octaves. Um, they're one octave up or down. And so it's very, very confusing for us because they are so perceptually similar. And so you'll get differences in responses. Um, and semitone intervals are really kind of equivalent to one another as well. So one of the ways that this is um, shown is graphically is through this pitch helix. Um, and so what's important to note from this, um, you don't need to by any means become intimately aware of the pitch helix, but what's important to know is that see all the A's are lined up in the red area and all the B's are lined up and all the C's and all the D's and all the E's and the F's and the G's are all lined up. Um, this is really showing us how these pitches and how these octaves are organized. Um, and again, this really allows us to see how these things are gonna be interpreted as more similar. This is a great image, um, especially for those of us who are not musically skilled, um, because it really takes those musical notes um, and it applies it to the frequency. Um, so you see a keyboard across the bottom um, and you see the hertz right above that. So which um, notes are related to which um, hertz? Um, so you can see as again, as we go up um, the scale, the, we will also go up in terms of pitch. Um, we will go up in terms of frequency. So on the left hand, the lowest number we have is 28 hertz. Um, on the right hand, the highest number we have is 4,186 hertz. Um, what's also nice about this is it kind of shows the overlap of what musical instruments can make um, these different notes, which is really nice. We know that the piccolo, even I know this from my elementary school music class, um, is one of the highest um, pitched um, musical instruments, wind instruments. Um, and again, we can see that here in terms of it will go all the way up to the end of this. Um, um, and it's going to have a very, a much higher pitch range um, than some of the other um, instruments, such as the tuba, which is going to have a very, very low range. So although pitch is really, really important, um, it's not all that's going on. Um, if we didn't have changes in loudness, if we didn't have changes in timing, um, it would still be difficult for us to make these distinctions. Um, so the different things that also are involved in music include dynamics. Um, and this is 
the way that the loudness changes as the music goes on. Um, so, you know, sometimes how the, it builds as you go, um, that would be an issue of dynamics as the song builds. Rhythm um, is going to be another one that we're probably all pretty familiar with. It's that that issue of timing, right? That temporal pattern um, of music. Um, and it really has three different components. It has tempo, which is that overall pace. It has beat, how um, spaced the pulses are, how equally spaced those pulses are. And it has meter, um, which is, again, that patterning of strong and weak pulses over time. Um, so, again... Both of these kinds of things are involved in our perception of music. Timber we talked about um, in chapter nine. Um, and again, even if we have the sounds that have the same pitch and the same loudness, the same difference in frequencies and amplitude, they can sound different if they're differing on timber. Um, so we know that again, this is a very complex um, piece of sound. And again, this is related to those differences in amplitudes and harmonic frequencies that we talked about in chapter nine. Um, and as those begin to begin and fade away and um, we see changes in this, um, this sound. Melody really refers to the sequence of the notes in a particular rhythm. And this is what the part that we're most familiar with as music listeners, right? Um, is that, you know, name that tune. Um, you're being asked to name that melody. Um, and so again, we can recognize these even if they're in different keys. Um, so you can play something higher than it's normally played and we're still gonna recognize that melody. You can play something lower than it's typically played and we're gonna recognize that melody. And there's even research that infants can do this as young as six months. They'll um, give them experience with one melody over a period of a week. Then they'll come back in and they'll test them with that same melody in a different key um, or a different melody. Um, and they'll still prefer to listen to the same melody in a different key, even though it's something that they've never heard before, which again really suggests um, that they're going to, that melody is an important component. And this really makes a lot of sense when we think that um, melody is really analogous to prosody in speech. So when I say prosody in speech, that's kind of the musicality in how we speak. Um, so I have spent so much time talking about prosody in my life because it's a big component of infant directed speech. And remember how I discussed that was kind of my area of interest. Um, and infant directed speech is how we all talk to babies. Um, so the yay baby um, is very, very different than how I tell you in adult directed speech. Good job. Um, there's a lot more musicality, there's a lot more differences in prosody, there's a lot more differences in melody um, in infant-directed speech than there is in adult-directed speech. And we know that infants really are paying attention to this information. Um, they can categorize different kinds of speech based on prosodic patterns, these patterns, this kind of music of speech, um, as again, around four months, if not earlier. Um, so again, we really see that this is really an important important feature for infants. Um, and in fact, infants may be using that information um, about how we talk to them long before they understand what the words mean that we're saying to them. Um, so it really makes sense that infants can do this with music as well because it's so salient to them. Um, when mom goes, oh, it's okay. Mom's trying to calm me down. That's important for the baby to know. Um, so again, this really analogous relationship between melody and prosody um, is really an important um, a skill, an important feature of sound um, for infants. So we also have um, consonants and dissonance. Um, and these are combinations of notes that either sound like they go together or sound like they don't go together. Um, so whether they, they either have that harmony or they lack it. So here's a, um, some audio that kind of shows you that.
So the consonant sounds sounded like they went together, uh, where the dissonant tones sounded like they didn't. Um, and we'll see that that really is basically the definition. Consonant sounds um, go together, and you can see this here. Um, we'll see those harmonics lining up, those purple lines and those red lines. And again, you don't have to understand music to just be able to understand the idea of consonants, um, that these things are lining up, these things are going together, and they're lining up with these other harmonics as well. Whereas dissonance um, is when something seems off and it could two or more notes um, and these sound unpleasant to us. Um, and that's going to look like this. And you can see again that those lines aren't matching up. Something is literally off. Um, and so again, um, we'll see the difference in that in terms of our perception um, of this. Again, we're going to want to more often listen to consonants music than we are to dissonant music. And again, knowledge is playing a role in music perception just as it played a role in speech perception. Our top-down processing influences this. Um, there's some really interesting research that says um, what we kind of, if we know a song, um, and again, I said so different songs can release dopamine. Um, if it's a song we really like, it's going to release more dopamine. And if it's a song we're really familiar with that we like, our brain's going to start releasing dopamine before it gets to our favorite part. Um, because it knows what's coming, this top-down processing. Um, and composers also use this to their advantage. Um, they understand the idea of expectations, um, of what we're expecting to hear. Um, and they're going to use that to their advantage to cause their, the listeners to kind of want to um, return um, to that initial key. So again, um, top-down information, our knowledge is playing a role in music processing just as it did speech processing. So this ends our conversation about chapter 11. Thanks.